morning, Bridgeway. I'm Pastor Mike, and I don't know if you are like me, but all that did that Justin just said was made me hungry, right? Like it's nine o'clock and I'm already thinking about lunchtime. <sighs> we'll have a talk later. It's all right, man. I think about food way too much anyways, but anyways, let's get actually to what we're here for today. Let's dive into the word. We're going to be talking in the book of Galatians because we are in the No Other Gospel series. It's a great book. It's actually a letter by Paul who wrote to the churches in Galatia. He's addressing the things that he's heard about them and encouraging them in their faith. Last week, Pastor Ron shared an awesome message where he was talking about how we are invited into a new family and we get to enjoy a new freedom through Jesus. If you missed it or you missed any of the messages, you got to go back, catch up on them. We've got them on our website or on our YouTube page. You can catch all of them there. Along with that, we've got some sermon discussion guides that go with these messages that you can dive in and you can um, dissect a little bit and take these sermons a little bit deeper. You can do that with your group, or with your family, or just by yourself. I encourage you to do that. But for today, if you can open up your Bible, whether your digital one or your paper one, or there's actually Bibles right under the seats in front of you, we're going to be in Galatians 5. We're going to be in Galatians 5 today. So go ahead and start working your way there. As you do, I want to catch us up just a little bit more than I already have. So in the past few weeks and also at the beginning of chapter 5, uh, we see that the churches in Galatia there are People are saying that you have to follow the rules of being a Jew, basically, in order to be able to follow Jesus. And one of the biggest things of that was circumcision, saying that those who are not circumcised cannot be part of the family. They can't be saved. They have to do, you know, follow Jesus and be circumcised. Paul hammers on this. He has a great discussion and uh, rebukes it and says that this is not the way. We already talked about that in earlier messages. He goes on to talk about how we have this great freedom in Jesus, a freedom that we cannot earn, but that he freely gives. And that's actually verse 1 of chapter 5. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. I love that verse. And so the question that we come back to and the question we've been asking a lot is, what can we add to Jesus? What can we really add to Jesus? And that's, that's the thing is we can't. We're not adding anything to Jesus. He's already done it all, and he is enough. So lots of great stuff, great messages. Pastor Ron and Pastor Justin have been sharing. Catch those. Go back and catch them. They're awesome. Today we're going to be just in four verses, starting at verse 7. So let's flip over to Galatians 5, 7 through 10, and we'll read those together and then work through them. All right, verse 7. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who's throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. So verse uh, 7 says you were running a good race. This is the verse we're going to focus on for most of the message here, kind of dissect it a little bit and see what we can gather from it. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? So my first question for you then is what is a good race? Right? He says you were running a good race. Paul uses this idea of running and actually he uses it a lot in his letters. Um, in fact, when he was in Corinth, there were games that were most likely happening while he was there, the Isthmian Games. I had to look this up because I was like, wait a second. I thought, you know, that's like Greek area. Shouldn't it be the Olympic Games, right? We all love the Olympic Games. And, and actually, in that time, there were the Olympic Games, but the Isthmian Games were bigger. They were more well attended. They happened every two years. I don't know if Paul went to this, but the point is, is that he would have known that this was happening and all the people around would have also known. And so the idea was well cemented in their heads. It's like he's preaching in the middle of the games happening. That's kind of what I picture. It's, it's ready in their heads and it's going around. So, so we have that in our minds as well. He chooses this idea because it's easily understood by them. Huge festival. It's happening at the same time. And if you were in, if you read 1 Corinthians, it's a great 
the great book that talks about, he says this verse actually, um, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. So what do we do for that? What is a good race? Well, it's, it's simple. It comes down to this. They believed. They, by faith, were welcomed into the family like we talked about. And they received the Holy Spirit. So what they are doing then is they are running their race with their eyes locked on Jesus. That's the good race. They're following him and letting everything else fall into place. And I believe Pastor Ron actually talked about this a ways back. I can't remember how far back. Um, but he talked about, you know, if you're following behind a rabbi in that time, you get so close behind them as a disciple that the dirt from the, the sandals of the rabbi would actually be falling and catching on you. You'd be catching the dust of the rabbi in front of you because you're so closely following behind. And that's, that's the good race. We are following so closely behind Jesus that we're catching some Jesus dust, right? Right? That's what we want to be doing. I want to be so close to following Jesus. And I'm catching the dust off of his feet. So this is a compliment. When I read this first part, I read it as, as a bit of a compliment. They were running well. And it's important to encourage each other with that. I know many of you, I've run into many of you, and if I haven't met you yet, I'm sure that I could say lots of great things about you too. And so it's important for you to hear that, that many of you are running well. You are running well. You believe, you by faith, you're welcomed into the family, you receive the Holy Spirit, and you are following so close to Jesus. And that is awesome. And the way, the best way that I can think about doing this is to, to understand about how to follow Jesus like that is to take this book and to just consume it like crazy because where else can we find such great information about the one that we love, about our Savior, about our Lord, about our God, than to dive into the book and to read about him and to hear what he says and to catch his wisdom and to catch his truth and to catch how much he loves you. So we dive in and we focus and we let the word of God speak about who he is. So the second part of this verse, so it says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Who cut in on you? So the temptation here is to get into like police investigator mode and be like, -na -na, who is it? Who's the one that cut in? And if you read the rest of the chapter, he doesn't even do that. Like, he just says this one time. He says, who once? Um, and he doesn't focus on the person. He's not actually that curious about the person. He's, he's more just confused, right? Like, Paul taught them. He trained them up. He told them about this freedom. And then somebody cut in. And he's like, how does this happen? Why are you doing this? Like, who cut in on you? And is confusing you. Why would you do? Why would you give up the freedom that we talked about and start living in the laws that you were consumed with before? So he cares about them. And sometimes, I mean, you could read this question and you, you like get pushed back, you get a little defensive, right? But I think he's not trying to make them defensive. He's he cares about them. He cares about them enough to ask them the clarifying question and to figure out what's actually going on. Who cut in on you? Other translations say, who threw an obstacle in your way, right? Like this isn't just line cutting where somebody jumps in front of you at the checkout lane at Meyer and you get really mad. That never happens to me. Um, but this is actually talking about something more. It's, it's talking about an obstacle or or when you follow somebody way off path, like that kind of a way, rather than just somebody cutting in front of you. And the best picture I can think of is actually a story um, from a movie. This one's gonna date me, but it's one of my favorite movies called Cool Runnings. I don't know if you, anybody know that movie? No, it's just me, that's fine. All three of us, perfect. 
All right, well, you all need some culture. We're going to work on that, okay? We're going to sit down, and for the next hour and a half, we're going to watch Cool Runnings. Just kidding. Uh, but this movie, what happens is it's about the Olympics, and it's about a Jamaican team, and there's a, there's a bunch of runners, and they're trying to train. They're training, and they're preparing for to the Olympic Games to be um, – to to make it on the Jamaican Olympic running team. And this is for the actual 100 meter dash, the uh, premier event is what they, they put it on. So at the point of the movie that I'm gonna show you in a second, they have been training for four years, preparing for this one shot to make it onto the team. So they're not even on the team, but they get one shot at the Olympic trials to run this race and to be the top four athletes to be able to make it onto the Olympic team and then go to the Olympics and race for their country. And this is what happens. Now, her face is actually what I think of when I think of Paul's face. She's just like, oh, you were running such a good race. Those three guys that fell, that's what the, the movie kind of circles around them and one other guy. Um, and you were running such a good race. Somebody steps in and cuts you off. <laughs> and now you're, the race is, is thrown. And this is what happens. He's just, he's blown out of his mind. He doesn't get it, how this could happen. You're running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? This is the, the third part of it, to keep you from obeying the truth. What does this look like now, since uh, we're not really having a big debate in our country right now about circumcision, right? Don't worry, though. We get confused about a lot of issues. You can look at any, and I could cherry pick any issue in our society right now and see how there's a lot of confusion and how it's creating division. But I'm just going to focus on salvation um, because I believe that's the heart of what he's even talking about. See, I think that in our society we get confused about salvation and we, you might hear this from time to time, is that people will take parts of the Bible that fit into what they want, and they'll say, yeah, that's good. But also, I kind of like this other aspect of this religion, or I kind of like this aspect of this religion, or I kind of like this idea. I don't even know if it's a religion, but they want to add it in because it's easier or because it fits their desire or because it gets them what they want. But the thing is, is that this book even talks against that, that this, the book, the word of God is the word of God. I mean, we can't add to it. We can't make more out of it. But this is the defining way of salvation. It says, he says that he loves us and he created a way for us to be with him. And he didn't have to give us any way, but I am so grateful that he did. And he did it out of his great love for us that he would give his son Jesus to create an opportunity for us to be right with him. And I love that, that he decided to do that. And so we have to, we have to come back to the word. But we need to keep on watching out because there are divisive people and there are false teachings in Romans 16, 17 through 18 Paul is talking at another time, and he says, and now I make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters, watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things that are contrary to what, they, uh, what you have been taught. Stay away from them. And there's lots of things. There's lots of things that are dividing, and there's lots of things that are being added on and saying Jesus and you need Jesus 
and you need this, Jesus and, and there's just, there's lots of things that we're adding to that our culture wants to or that we get tempted to. And there's lots of reasons for why, right? Why are people stepping in and doing this? Why are they stepping in and dividing and teaching falsely? And it could be about money, it could be about power, it could be about our own selfish gain, or it just could be that we're people that are sinful by nature and that we get caught up in our own desires and that's what we want, is we want people to teach us what we already think. Second Timothy 4, three through four, I'm not gonna put it on the screen, but I'm just gonna read it real quick, because I think this says it better than I could say it. Paul's talking to um, one of his disciples, Timothy. He says, a time will come when people will not listen to accurate teachings. Instead, they will follow their own desires and surround themselves with teachers who tell them what they want to hear. And that's where we have to be careful to not be so focused on what other people think more than what Jesus thinks about us. I want to be speaking the word. I want to be sharing the gospel from what Jesus tells us, from what God tells us. And the problem with this is that when somebody dives in and they get caught up and they get confused that it doesn't just stay there see Galatians 5 8 through 9 says that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough see in the video a minute ago where we were watching the three runners run you see the one fall in the middle and he's actually a little bit behind but we see him fall and he doesn't just fall in like Stay out of the way of everybody, right? He takes out the person on his left, and he takes out the person on his right. And so when, when we're starting to add, and we're starting to say and, and we're starting to pull on other things to say, well, you need the Bible, and you need this. You need Jesus, and you need this. Then we start to, we can start to, we, we get lost, we get off track, and we tend to bring other people down with us. A little taints the whole. It makes it all bad. And the thing is, is it causes rivalry. It separates us in the church when we're meant to be together. We're meant to be unified on what the word says, right? Instead of all going for the, what do we have in here? 100 to 200 people. 100 to 200 different ideas of what we want, of what we think. If I laid it out to us today and I said, hey, you know, how do we, what do we think that the world should be like? And let's do this. Let's just make our own rules and make our own path. We'd all come up with our own ideas. But the problem is, is that we already have a way. And I think it's the best way. And the way is Jesus. So let's be unified. And let's be centered on what we need to be. And that's what I think is, is the biggest combat to all of this is to root ourselves in the word. Start with the Bible. We wanna be true to what the Bible says. Let's let the Bible tell us. Instead of us deciding, then seeing if we can fit the Bible into that, let's let the Bible tell us who God is. Let's let the Bible tell us how to live. In fact, I think we should be doing that today even. Check me, right? I'm a human just like you. Does what I say fit with what the Bible says? We should be checking that all the time, driving ourselves back to the word. The second thing I think we should be doing is engage the cutting in. See, Paul does this in chapter two, and you can go back and catch that message later where he confronts Peter when Peter is off base and he's making circumcision too much of a thing. Paul calls him out and says, hey man, you're adding to the gospel. And he does this in the beginning of chapter 5. He's engaging, I'm sorry, throughout chapter 5, where he's gauging the ideas where people are being confused. Now, I love one of my favorite verses is James 5, 20, where James says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, 
Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sin. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sin. Let's be these people, right? In love to draw each other back to Jesus, to the truth. But if you're like me, sometimes I have kind of a thick head, right? I can kind of get stuck in my ways. And I don't know if, I don't know if you guys know this, but so I'm um, growing this plant at my house. Um, I made a little project with my kids. And we, I saw this thing, I don't know where I saw it, but I saw this thing and uh, you can cut off the top of a pineapple and you can like plant it in soil and then it'll start growing, right? And to get me the pineapple, you know how long I have to wait? I've been doing this for six months and I'm about ready for the pineapple. They said three to four years in a good climate. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm like waiting for eight years to try and get this pineapple in Michigan or what. But this is how I am sometimes, right? Like, I want my growth to be now. I want the pineapple right now. But it takes me a while to get things. So as we're engaging, as we're drawing people back, let's do this with love. Let's do it with an enormous amount of care. And let's do it to actually do that, to bring people back and not just be right. I love where the Bible talks about peacemakers and us being peacemakers. And, and I think sometimes we think that, you know, other people can be the peacemakers and we're grateful for them. We were like, wow, this is like magic. They just make peace in the home or with, the, with other people. But I think it's actually really difficult because they're stepping into the issues and they're engaging with people when it's easier to avoid it, when it's easier to stay quiet and when it's easier to just not care. But let's be these peacemakers. Let's step in and win these people back. In Galatians 5, 10, we'll read this a second. And as I prepare to, if I can have the worship team start making their way back up here. Galatians 5, 10 says, there's a, uh, it just talks about how there's a penalty in store for those who lead others away. It says a little, oh, I'm sorry. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who's throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. See, there is a penalty in store for those who lead others away, which is both comforting and really sad to me at the same time. See, it's justice for the consequence of their actions but sad because I wish and hope that even for that person, that they might hear the truth in love and once again be restored to running their good race. So my encouragement to us today is to leave a little bit more like Paul. If you, if you jumped back to verse 7, you'd see that he's encouraging people. So let's encourage others. Let's care enough to ask concerned questions that point people back to the truth. Back to a relationship with the one God who loves us and wants us, even with our mess, even with our confusion, even with our imperfections, because we're all that way. And let's follow the right leader. Let's follow Jesus so close that you're getting the dust off of his feet. Dive into this word, consume it, and get to know him. Get to know this God who's madly in love with you, and don't let other people cut in and try and add more to it. Let me pray for us today. Father God, you are a good God, and I am so grateful that, that you didn't just let us be, that you didn't just let us sit in this, but that God, that you offered us a way. You offered us your son that we could know him, that we could be forgiven because of what he has done, that he has paid the price for everything we've done wrong, and so we have a good status before you, so we are made right with you, and so we can follow you 
and be in your family so that we can live in the freedom so that we can live with you forever. God, I pray against anything that wants to divide, anything that wants to speak what's contrary to your word. God, I pray against it in our lives even today as we're sitting in this place. If there's things in our mind that we are adding to, God, would you convict us of those things and would you draw us back to you? God, give us courage to speak into the lives of those around us. Give us courage to love them in the middle of that, to share truth and love, and to draw each other back to the one hope that we have, and that's through your son, Jesus. God, we give you this day and we worship you now because you are the one that is worthy of all of our praise. In your name I pray, amen.